Welcome to today's show. My guest today is Mandy Jankis. She is a grief coach. I invited her here today. I haven't yet shared with you all that I lost my father in December. He had a massive stroke and passed away three days after. My parents were married nearly 56 years. My brother and I grew up knowing big love, and it's been a tremendous loss for my family. And what I found is that I have a lot of friends and colleagues who've also lost their parents, and we don't always know how to help the people we love through grief or how to move through grief ourselves. So I invited Mandy here today to help us make sense of things and also give us a direction in moving forward as we navigate these tremendous losses that we face in our lives. This is a safe space and I'm honored to be here. Thank you for being here today, Mandy. Uh, we will have uh, some difficult conversation. This conversation will be somewhat difficult because we're talking about grief. And I really appreciate you being here as an expert. Uh, and that's the first thing I want to establish to the audience is your cred credibility, your education. There's a lot of people who call themselves a coach, your grief coach, and most or some people, I should say, are not truly qualified to be a grief coach. So I want to first establish that for our audience. And then also thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk today. I have not shared with my audience one bit about losing my dad six months ago. And I thought coming on here with you would be a good start. And it would also help other people who've had a similar loss. Yeah, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about then your training and education, because I really want to establish that you have made tremendous effort to make sure you're qualified to talk on this subject. I really appreciate you acknowledging that. I've been a college educator for almost 20 years, and I earned my life coach certification through IPAC, which is an institution certified by the International Coaching Federation. So going into coaching, I went through a program where there's a board of ethics, and we had testing to ensure that we were understanding each you know, level of mastery. And since then, I have also gone through Brene Brown's training in both the Daring Way and Dare to Lead. So she's taken her research and turned it into a curriculum for helping professionals. And in doing that, I had to um, continue my coaching hours. So now I'm at a level PCC certified life coach, in addition to having insurance, right? So having insurance while I'm working with clients, I think is really important especially given the nature of what we're talking through. I focus now more on grief. Um, I think five years ago, my focus was more on shame. Both of those are very murky, dark places to lead people to, right? And, and you have to know how to also help them out of those dark places because they are very human places. Mm -hmm. After I lost my mom, I will be honest with you, I really thought I was going to get some sort of checklist about what I was going to experience. And I thought, I'm going to be a good student and I can get through this. And there are these stages I kept hearing about. And it did not take long to know and live and understand that that is not how grief works. And after some time passed, I became interested in really learning the ins and outs of what is this thing and how do I help others understand it and walk through it? And that is when I started working with Claire Bidwell-Smith and Hope Edelman. Hope Edelman is kind of the queen, the, the founder of Mother Loss. She wrote one of the first books on what happens as women when we lose our mothers. And, and they both um, team up and do solo workshops and trainings for, again, helping professionals to become certified in the nature of grief work. In our circle, we also like to use the phrase phrases grief literate or grief informed. Okay. Okay. One of the things that I think is important is, you know, you talked about like a checklist of what how does that look when you lose your parent, lose your mother specifically for you. And when I lost my husband, I was only 32 years old. And I had one friend who was a widow, Heather Urich, the late Heather Urich, 
and um, she was 50s in her 50s. And so that was a very different thing. The thing we had in common is they had adopted a child. Um, they had grown children and then they had an adopted child that was approximately my son's age, around five years old also. So she was still mothering. Um, but she was most definitely, you know, 20 years ahead of me in life experience and and coping abilities and all of the things. And so uh, I didn't have anyone that I could really relate to. I, I went to some widow support groups and things like that. And what I found since losing my dad in December, I lost him. We lost him very suddenly. Um, he had a massive stroke on a Thursday and died on the following that Sunday. And uh, what I found is there are people like you and other people I've talked to who have lost a parent. And that is a much more common loss. It is what our parents hope for that we lose them and they don't lose us. And so what I found about grief and that losing my dad, the person I think most on the planet who taught me how to choose the man I would spend my life with has really um, in some way eased the grief I felt over the man I actually chose to spend my life with, Wesley. Wow. And it's an interesting lesson in grief because I couldn't have known what this would feel like. I've been living with the other for 20 years. Yeah. So I think as we get older, grief compounds and we lose more people and we lose them to different circumstances and most of them feel beyond our control. Yeah. And so what I'd like to talk about today partly is about how no loss is the same but what we get to learn as these losses accumulate, because I have learned more about myself in the past six months than I think I did in the 20 years I'd been a widow. Wow. Because of this compounding loss, I think. Like these two men in my life are gone and and how each of them help shape who I am. And so what do you say to people who who feel like the hits keep coming, like, you know, the loss happens and then maybe something else stressful in life happens and and then this other thing happens. And so how do you make space for the grief so that we can really work in it so that we can learn as we go and we're not trying to, we're not trying to shove it down and get it out of the way. I think it's so important to try to learn the lesson as we're in it. We don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, the messy middle. Attention to that so that we don't linger yeah. too long in one spot. And too long is maybe not the greatest term because there is no timeline, there's no rule, but. I think if I'm understanding you correctly, what you mean by too long is this n nature of the, the expression of feeling grief in a way that is keeps you stuck from moving forward, right? Um. That's a beautiful and hard question, and I will be honest with you, as you were saying that, it feels like my life for the last five years. So 18 months after my mom died, my mother-in-law passed away, mm -hmm. and then my grandfather passed away, and then an uncle passed away, and then last year my husband's brother was killed in a tragic car accident, and then we lost our dog, my kid's first pet. So it it really has been five years of very grand loss in our family. Compounded grief. Compounded grief. Yeah. And there's also this idea of these secondary losses because as you describe when you were in your 30s and you didn't have folks around you who were experiencing what it was like to lose a partner, there are losses that occur from the, the separation of friendships or the changing of relationships. Yes. So things around your life start to feel unsettled. And I think the best thing that we can do is much like Brene Brown talks about shame, we have to speak grief. Grief is not something we were meant to do alone. And it's not something that we're only meant to do in the shower and quietly. There are so many expressions of this big emotion, right? Some days your grief feels angry and some days it feels anxious or scared. And some days your grief feels lonely and some days your grief feels really sad. And so learning how to name 
the pieces of your grief that are showing up for you helps other people better understand where you're at and give you the support that you need. When we keep that closed away, and as you said, try to shove it down or power through or toughen up, yeah, that's not going anywhere. It's metastasizing within us. And eventually we blow, whether it be falling apart in the grocery store, falling apart with our kids, it's going to come out somehow. Even creating illness in our bodies. Yes. Illness in our bodies. Yeah. I want to take a quick break. And um, when we come back, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. We'll be back in just a moment. I'm back with Mandy Jenkins. We are talking about grief. You are a grief coach, uh, kindred coaching. And one of the things that we were just touching on in the first segment is about com- compound grief, compounding grief when like the hits keep coming and things keep happening. And even if you have one isolated loss, other things in your life can make it hard to move through that grief. What I have realized is that I have grieved my late husband every day for 20 years in some capacity. Now, when I say that, that makes it sound like I'm curled up on a couch in the fetal position, sad about my life. And that's just not true. Um, I've built a beautiful life. I've rebuilt my life. I am a second chance taker (laughs) as many times as I'm given. And anyone who knows me well knows that. But what I mean by that is that when you lose someone, for me, losing my husband so young, when my our son was so young, there are these milestones and rites of passage our son has experienced that trigger grief for me. And what I'm learning with losing someone who my father still died too young, just a month short of 75, I don't know how much time would have felt like enough, but it didn't feel like enough for sure, is that now instead of the grief being what what I for what we didn't have like my husband and I it's it's the reality of the impact my dad has had in my life and so I think the best way to honor him and how we honor our parents is to hopefully focus on what we had and what we were gifted and to process that grief in a way that honors them because I think parents want you to keep going and keep going with that beautiful life but it's so hard to you know you don't expect you know you're gonna lose your parents but I never expected to live this long without him you know because his family lives to be in their 80s and 90s and it still seems too soon yeah so the too soon part how do you reconcile with that or do you? That's a powerful and and unknown question. I think most people would argue that we don't ever feel like we have enough time. I got to hold my mom's hand and say goodbye to her. And after days of her struggling to to breathe and and you know, thinking she was taking her last breath, she finally did. And I was like, come back five minutes, give me five more minutes, please. So I think that what you're saying, you know, you mentioned he helped you choose your husband. So in many ways, he helped you know how to choose your husband. He was your guide. By example. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so now you're almost like the ship that's still out at sea and you've lost your lighthouse in some ways. And it is important to keep going. And so I think when we're looking at a, a timeline, you're still in very early grief. Way early. Mm-hmm. And the most beautiful thing that you can do is figure out how you want your relationship with your father to look. Mm-hmm. As you grow older, as your child gets older, how will you continue to bring him into your life and honor him? Does it look like rituals? Does it look like sh- sharing stories? Does it look like writing him letters? I think that establishing that reconnection now that it's different because he's not earth side is going to help you come to the acceptance that what happened wasn't fair. And, right, you're a second chance taker. 
and you're going to keep yeah. going. Well, and I say this, and for the audience who's watching, this is not, it's like the show is Life with Lisa. And I always say it's not about my life, it's about yours. And and I have some life experiences that are what some people would think pretty tough stuff, but also some really great stuff. And so we're sitting here talking, looking to the audience, we're talking about my dad, but I really, I know that grief is so similar when we lose a parent that from what I'm the conversations I'm having with friends who've lost a parent and so please just insert yourself into whatever Mandy is saying because this isn't about me I'm choosing to share about my dad because I think it can be of help to people who are watching who are going through something similar or have been through something similar or have a friend who's going through something similar so we know how to support that grief. And that's my next question. So some people are really get great at casseroles. I happen to be really good at writing and creating slideshow videos that, you know, bring emotion and help tell a story. So, and then there's other people who um, are really good at just showing up and like being of help wherever it's needed. And I've had people ask me over the years, what do I do to help? How do I help this friend? What do I do? What would you want people to do for you? And I think we are who we are times 10 in a crisis. So if you're someone who knows how to show up and wants to show up with food, show up with food. Yep. You know, people ask me about my mom, like, should we're getting all these casseroles and all this. And what I said, well, what her closest friends, I'm like, bring her an extra plate from your dinner because then you're going to visit with her and she won't have so much food left over for one person. It's hard to open the fridge and see all this food that you used to share. People don't think about that. Yes. So bring one plate to your friend who lost her husband or your friend who lost his wife or or wife, husband, whatever it is. Um, and just try to think about what you're good at and what you can give. Yeah. What you have to offer. Yeah. I think that that's beautiful advice. And I think to speak to what you're saying, oftentimes people will say to, to grievers, what do you need? Yeah. And they, they don't know. know. We don't know what we need. Yeah. And if we did, we're probably not going to ask for it. It's true. And so um, other things, especially in early grief that I think are really important and beautiful and helpful are those ordinary moments of life that can feel very tough. Do they have a dog or an animal? Go over and say, I'm taking your dog for a walk. You know, um, do you have somebody who you know who cleans houses? Say, hey, I'm going to set you up in your bed. You're going to get watch Netflix all day. There's somebody going to come over and clean your house for you. Uh, so just things that seem like it's yeah. like ordinary yeah. moments in life that feel too much. I mean, I know the days and weeks and, and months after just getting to the grocery store felt like a, a heroic. I was, I was just going to say that I read a post a while back, just it was titled groceries. And it was about how don't ask someone what they need. Just send groceries. Well, there's so many Instacart. There's all these ways that we can just yeah. deliver groceries to someone's house. Just, just do that. If you ask someone what they need, they're probably not going to tell you. So just do the best you can with the skills that you have or by sending groceries, sending groceries. Um, if they don't have someone who's mowing their lawn regularly and their husband has to do that, send your 15 year old to go mow their lawn, whatever the case. And so just fill in whatever gap you can. Let's take a break and when we come back, we'll talk specifically about how you help coach people through grief and what that looks like because you know, it's a, it's a learn as you go process, but having someone perhaps guide you through it is helpful. So we'll be back in just a moment. We are wrapping up with you, Mandy. I think we could probably do a multiple part series with you about grief. Uh, and maybe we will. Let's talk about what it looks like to be coached through grief because some people would be interested in what that looks like. So what is it that you do to start them out? And what is the outcome that you hope for when working with somebody who's facing the loss of a parent specifically, because you were talking about losing your mom? 
Yeah. Grief coaching is a lot like other forms of coaching. The biggest the biggest thing that we do first is get a baseline of what is or isn't happening. So understanding the loss, when the loss occurred, the type of loss. Again, I like to include some grief education so folks understand that there are different types of grief and help them understand what they may be feeling. For example, if somebody is coming to me who is, who has a parent who is ill and knows that they're going to die, they're already in grief, and that's called anticipatory grief. So they're feeling some kind of way because they're in it already. From there, I take a, a CBT approach, so cognitive behavioral therapy, and that is helping folks understand how their thoughts connect and impact with their emotions, which connect and impact their behaviors. And we talk through scenarios of what is going through your mind. And when you hear this phrase, she's going to die, for example, where do you feel that in your body? And what emotions does that bring up for you? How does it impact your behavior? Is it impacting your behavior? Are you able to work? What are your relationships looking like? Who are your safe people, right? Fill those seats of empathy and compassion so that you have the people around you who know what you need and what you're feeling. And the overall outcome is surviving grief, truly, in a way that allows you to feel your feelings because a lot of people like to put it on a timeline. You hit the year mark and it's like, okay, you're good to go, right? No, it's with you always. So learning how to use your own words, having the courage to say to folks, I'm always going to miss him or her. I'm always going to have griefy moments. There's always triggers and I need you to understand and respect that. So after we get through the tough stuff, it becomes understanding how to really continue to speak your grief as well as keep your person alive in your heart, in your spirit. I think that um, when you said, you know, a year mark or whatever the rule is, um, there is no rule. Uh, people kind of think you should be moving to this point by now or that point by now. And what I think is really true is that pe people might be coming to you in the second year because I know I thought the second year after losing my husband would get better. And when it didn't, I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. You know, I got through all the firsts yeah. and then here we are circling around again. And so, um, you know, if you're if you're at that year mark or, you know, year and a half mark and you're thinking, well, I thought it'd be better by now. And it is better in some ways. You recognize the welling up of things. But um, I just appreciate you talking with us and sharing your experience, but also sharing how you help others. So thank you. again, Kindred Coaching, thank you for being here, Mandy, and thank you for educating yourself in a field that's very difficult work, but important work nonetheless. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much.